Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prague Seat. It's Tuesday night. We're talking Prague as we do on this very evening. And tonight, we're going to talk about a beloved band, not only with this panel who does this show, but amongst our fans. In fact, we've had lots of viewers ask us to do a show all about Gentle Giant. We've got the reissue of The Missing Piece coming out fairly soon. So why not talk about the catalog one more time before we eventually talk about that again? And uh, the assignment I've given everybody tonight is to think long and hard about this catalog. Oh. I've lost Lewis already before I can even introduce him. <laughs> think long and hard about this catalog and pick out your three favorite Gentle Giant albums and rank those three which is very tough considering most people believe that this band has anywhere from five to six to seven classic albums in a row, depending on kind of where you sit. So picking a top three is not all that easy. Let me introduce the crew here. We got my fellow New Yorker, two of them actually, mm -hmm. Chuck Alvarez and Eric Porter. They're hundred and something miles apart. I'm kind of right in the middle of them. Represent <laughs> New York. We got to represent the state of New Jersey, the Professor of Prague, Chad Hutchins, Chad Hutchins, Ken Golden, Chad. <laughs> Sorry, oh my God. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It's been a long day, guys. It's been a long day. Uh -oh. Ken Golden, Hi. Professor of Prague. <laughs> Sorry, representing New Jersey. Chad represents Pennsylvania on this show as well as uh, Anthony. Uh, Lewis is coming back, and let me introduce one of our two fellows from Chicago. George Lemay is in the house also from Four Fusion Friday. And he's back in Mexico once again at rehearsal. Hopefully uh, we get him on camera momentarily. The great Louis Nasser is here as well. He's off in the studio with Luz de Rayada. Louis, can you hear us yet? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. We also want Louis to go first because I know he's got rehearsals to do. So, uh... Pete, do I, do I need a name tag or... Uh oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm human, Ken. Come on. <laughs> All right. I know Ken longer than anybody on this panel, so he he shouldn't be busting my horns there. But yeah, it's been a long day. So. We were talking about Chad before. I got. I was just looking at Chad's list, and I had Chad on the brain. Sorry. What can I tell you? Okay. All right. So Lewis is popping in and out. So we'll we'll wait for him to hop back in. Uh, let's get started with Chuck. So Chuck, why don't we you give me your three, two, and one, and talk about why for this great band, Gentle Giant. Okay, my number three is um, Three Friends. My number two is Octopus. And my number one is In a Glass House. Okay, starting with Three Friends. Um, what's it? At? Relatable songs. A lot of, um, um, just um, I love the aspect of Three Friends um, getting to meet with each other. Um, what's a, they, You know, they grow up together and then they form, they distance themselves away and then they come back together. Just a beautiful theme, um, a lot of songs on this album. Then you have the great Octopus. Um, Octopus, um, under normal circumstances, probably would have been my number one. Um, it's just a strong album from beginning to end. Even the, what's it, because I love River. River is a great song. You know, um, what's it, and then you have, um, what, in my opinion, is one of my top five um, progressive rock albums in, in A Glass House. I've always loved that album. Um, I remember buying a very expensive bootleg of the album. Actually, not a bootleg, but a, a very, very expensive vinyl version of this album um, at the time, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You know, um, but to, you know, uh, as mentioned beforehand, what we were talking about before, you know, this, you know, you could easily pick um, eight to ten of their or um, ten of their albums as their number one. But I just think that, in my opinion, that these three albums right here just represent what's great about Gents and Giants. So my number three, once again, is Three Friends. My number two is Octopus. And my number one is In a Glass House. All worthy, for mm -hmm. sure. All worthy. And I'm sure they're all going to get mentioned today. I'm, I'm just really curious, like, um, how much of this catalog gets counted up today amongst our picks. Lewis, I mean, uh, yeah, Lewis, we're going to go over to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you hear me okay, Lewis? Or some more source on the Mexican internet. Come on, <laughs> he's frozen, <laughs> he's stuck. No, okay. All righty, Ken. So, and yes, I'm talking to you. Right. So, poor Chad, this was very, very hard to choose. It's there's there's no right or wrong answer with this band. Mm -hmm. 
Nope. They, they just had this incredible run of albums there. I couldn't think of another band that was as consistent as Gentle Giant. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I'll be, frankly, I'll be surprised if, if we come up with any kind of consensus. So, uh, no, no, no right or wrong answers with this no. band, really. Unless you're picking Civilian or Giant for a Day. There's no... Well, uh, Civilian is an excellent album. I but so don't don't disagree with that. And so, I mean, I disagree. No, don't be talking different. shit about Civilian. And, it, and yeah, um, let, the, Giant for a Day is a different story. Let, let's see if it's on anybody's <laughs> list. And then get back to me. So, my, all, right. all right. So my my number three, and again, I think it's just unbelievable. Anything I didn't mention, any album I didn't mention, it's not because I don't think it's incredible. It's because I only I can only pick three. So my number three is Octopus. You'll note if I could show it my little mu the music box sticker for two dollars and fifty cents. Ooh, when I bought this, yeah, when I bought this in nineteen seventy six. Nice. And, uh, it was and of course, with the UK cover on it, not the US press. Oh, sure. Vertigo. Yeah, we got the we got the whole Roger Dean thing going on. And um, it's, you know, to me, that's just kind of like a sentimental favorite. They're doing they're really getting into that whole madrigal contrapuntal thing uh, it really comes to the forefront. I think for me, this is probably the one that really had like the strongest medieval feel that people refer to. Is sort of you know uh, Ray Shulman's violin is all over the album, mm -hmm. and you know front to back it's got some of their best tracks: Advent of Panurge, Rock on mm -hmm. Tour, Troubadour. Mm -hmm. I love Knots. Knots is like fucking yep. crazy. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Boys in the band. I mean, it's like I think that this might be the one album if somebody came over and they said, "What does General Giant sound like?" or "What does you know what does prog rock sound like?" Octopus might be the album that I would play for them. And, even even uh, more so than Three Friends? Yeah, but yes. And again, you know, Three Friends is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it's a fantastic record. Uh, you know, it's very facetious when you say splitting hairs. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, you know, and the thing is, the thing about that, if you, you know, it's really incredible if you stop and think about it. The first album was 1970. Think yeah. about what was going on in 1970, right? And you had three friends was what seventy one, mm -hmm. so that's like, like you know, Tarkus was oh, out yeah, seventy one. You know, I mean, you know, the Yes album. I mean, it's really, really quite incredible what they were doing, and they, and what's even more incredible is that, considering what they were doing at that time, that they weren't more widely appreciated. So. Uh, I don't know if it's. Were, I think they were a little too eclectic for mainstream tastes. Is my yeah, opinion. but sometimes eclectic kind of stood out from the bunch, you know. Oh, so, I I agree. Yeah. I so you know, so yeah, you know those 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 early albums are you know acquiring the taste. Uh, I'm sure they will pop up. Right, it's a great great record. Mm -hmm. but for me, Octopus is great, and also the other thing about Octopus, great sounding album. I love. Yes. I love playing, mm -hmm. that. I love playing that record for friends. Um. And and also the other, actually I should mention almost all their catalog was great sounding. These guys really, they really had it dialed in. My number two, <clears throat> this one I don't know if anybody will agree, but for me, Freehand. Oh, I love got, it. This one's got the Stephen Wilson mm -hmm. uh, mix on it also. And the reason I made it number, there you go. I mean, it's fantastic. And I think for some people they think of Freehand as the as their best, but for me. I think it has their best material, but it's kind of front loaded. I think that it's all on side one. Side one is, you know, you got just the same on reflection. Then you get freehand, which is the mm -hmm. gang, like mm -hmm. nuts. And then <clears throat> and then side two, I find just a lit falls a little flat, just a little. So that's why it's not my number one. And my number one, which I think is their best album. Power and the Glory. Wow. Okay. So, and again, original British copy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think it's front to back. I think it's their most consistent album. There's no let up. Uh, it's incredibly complex. I mean, but it's tuneful. Uh, and by and this they, time, and they also rocked hard too. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's no. I, I wrote and my I said there's there's, there's no let up, and yeah. you know by this time they had it all figured out. They got proclamation, so sincere. Mm-hmm. Aspirations playing the game, cogs and cogs. It's like a murderer's row of gentle giants. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I this you know I, I I'm sick and tired of hearing gentle giant, but <laughs> I got to say this. I just kept coming back to this, and it just kept kicking my ass. It's just. <laughs> Well, never, Ken, never. Hmm? Never sick of him. <laughs> ah, well, you know, I mean, I immerse myself in well, it. Well, for two weeks, right? That's what we've all been doing. Yeah, and, you know, and and the thing is, because the band is so consistent, after a while, it all sort of merges together into this big miasma of, of Channel Giant, you know, counterpoint. And, uh, you know, you get, a, you get a little crazy from it. But... Uh, Great. You know, one, one thing I love about this band is that they don't have any albums that were more than 40 minutes. Yeah, mm. they're all very short. Yep, they're all short, but, <laughs> uh, but they say so much in all their songs. Yep, and they didn't do big, long epics either. Right. No. It's, it's all killer, no filler. Yep. That was, yeah. that was, the, thing, that was the one thing. They, when I keep thinking about the consistency, they never had a Supper's Ready or a Close to the Edge mm-hmm. but or, or even a Firth of Fifth. You know that one. They don't. Really, they don't have a signature track. No, right. Mm-mm. They have a signature sound, but they don't have a signature track. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? There isn't that one track that you point to, on, on and you know. I, I don't think it, you know. So uh, anyway, it was fun doing. We're gonna it. go to Lewis. I knew Lewis was kind of shaking his head there. Mm-hmm. I, I, and what I'm meaning is like, like for for yes, when you're talking about to someone about yes who's never heard them. Go go listen to Close to the Edge. Go listen to Roundabout. There's usually a song or two you can point them to. Same thing with right. the ELP, same thing with Genesis. I find with this band, you can point them to 10 songs. And right. the 10 songs are a little bit different, right? Because none of they really never did the same thing twice, in my opinion. So, mm-hmm. um, Lewis, let's move over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm not in any hurry. Don't worry. It's just that <laughs> okay, um, that's good. My, my, my only desperation was finding a spot in this studio where and the internet one. was somewhat stable. <laughs> I am right next to the bathroom. I won't show you what it looks like, but here we are in a legendary studio in Mexico City. All right, so before we, we go to the picks, I just want to say this is an impossible task. Mm-hmm. The, the only thing that was clear for me was my number one, and that's purely for sentimental reasons. Um, but everything else in their catalog, with the exception of Giant for a Day, is absolutely <laughs> masterful. So, yep. you know, I really struggled with this, but I, I had to come up with some kind of order. And to understand just how popular this band is, not only do you have the Gorg, just now that I was on tour in Argentina, I, I came across this great radio program called Gigantes Gentiles, which is a gentle giant, mm-hmm. run by Kike Tagliardi. And it, it is such a great pleasure to see all these people all over the world who are just gentle giant freaks. And um, so, you know, it's it, it's hard to do, but I guess we have to rank them somehow, choose our best three. So for today, I'm going to have to go with number three, three friends. And I'm choosing that one because, frankly, Peel the Paint yep. is just such a killer yep. mm-hmm. showcase of Gary Green's yep. mm-hmm. talent on guitar. Yep. I'm not I'm not just saying that because Gary is a friend of mine. That song smokes. I mean, yep. that literally will peel the paint mm-hmm. off your fucking wall. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, it's just a great record, top to bottom. Like has been mentioned by Chuck and others, the albums are concise, mm-hmm. but they're extremely dense statistically. There's a lot of information in those 38, 39 minutes. So it really, you have to pay a lot of attention. My number two, I think just from the global sound, the packaging, the songs, I would have to go with Octopus. Mm-hmm. Octopus, I mean, the advent of Panurge and um, Knots. I mean, come on. Yep. Come on, right? I can tell it's, it's super good. Uh, yes. I mean, it's it, 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 it just like most of the records, it's an almost perfect album to me. Yep. Mm-hmm. And my number one, and this was always clearly going to be my number one, it's never not been my number one, is in a glass house. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, and that is because um, when I when I first discovered Gentle Giant, that was the record. 
Yep. And a little bootleg cassette. And I, there you go. That thing. It's a masterpiece. Um, Ray Shulman has always been a, a huge influence in how I approach the bass guitar. Mm -hmm. Most people never, never hear it, except for Mike Keneally, who said that obviously I was heavily into Ray Shulman. Mm -hmm. And that record is a master class on how you play yep. prog rocking bass, not yep. just like fluffy, like even more so than Mike Rutherford, who really does a great job, or um, Chris Squire. Ray Shulman does all that aggression and all that muscle within counterpoint. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, it's, it's really impressive to hear. And of course what he does with the violin and he's multi-instrumentalist, but it, it's just, uh, to me, it, it's, it's, it, it may not be their most popular record, but it's their most accomplished. Yep. In my opinion, same thing. Mm -hmm. So the, for me, that's an easy number one is um, in a glass house. The others, there's tiny little, finely shaven pubic hairs that that, that, <laughs> that distinguish them but um but what can i say this is these are my choices for today so i you know, i forgot to ask everybody during the turn but i'll start with lewis and i'll, I'll work my way back did your final three after spending time with the band's albums again over the last couple of weeks did your final three deviate at all from where you thought your what you thought your final three would be Yes, I thought for sure, you know, Power and the Glory would be there. Mm -hmm. I, I and I also thought Free Hand. But the thing is, is that after hearing them over and over and over, I, I do agree with Ken. I think that if you want to get a, a a gentle giant album for people who don't know them, Octopus is probably the way to go. Yep, it has, it's a little less rough. And it has all the elements. Mm -hmm. And it just sounds so good. I think the sequencing of the album is also great. So it's, it makes for a very smooth listening. And um, Three Friends is just a record that for a long time has been very near and dear to me. And as I went through them and I played it again top to bottom, I, I wanted to put interview there. I wanted to put them all in there. Right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I thought for sure part of the glory because I mean, Cogs and Cogs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... Population. But, yeah, but it was hard, man. This was a very hard assignment. Yeah, for sure. Chuck, did you did your final three deviated off from what you kind of expected, or maybe what you claimed as your favorites were a month ago, a year ago, ten years ago? No, no these have always been my my top three albums, and okay. with um, In a Glass House being um, in my top five uh, all the time progressive rock albums, maybe even like in even the top three. Actually, that's how much I love these three albums. Um, which uh, uh, it's four through four through eight, nine, ten, so which is very difficult to to pick between, except for um, what's a, the the their second to last album. And so the one that shall not be named. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the one with the stupid mask on the front. Right? Yeah. We will not name it. We will not name mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, that album. But anyway, no, I just think that their album was just um, consistently strong. Um, which um, I also one they had to mention that they had no albums that um were over forty minutes. And I'm very glad that they didn't put um the the title track to the power and the glory on that album because I think that that's a stinky song. You know, but um, what's it other than that? And so what's a, these have always been my top three. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet you yours deviated a little bit from what you might have anticipated. A, a little bit. Originally, I was anticipating that in Glass House would have been there. Um, and maybe even, and at one point acquiring the taste, wow. right? you keep mm -hmm. going through the records over and over, you know, mm -hmm. and you got to come up with just three octopus for me was, was locked in because that was just the sentimental favor for me. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the one I probably played the most, but you know, but yeah. Then, like I said, power and the glory for me, it was like, it all kind of came together. It's like, this is the one it's like killer. It's a killer. It's a killer. And, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I weeded out. I had you know had to weed it out. It's, like I said, there's no wrong answers. No, wrong. there really isn't. There really isn't. All right, so move over to George. Curious to see what George come up with here. George will come up with the wrong answers. Go. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> number three is Power and the Glory. Mm -hmm. This is actually the first one I ever heard. Mm -hmm. Same here. I got less experience with these guys than everybody. It's only been within the last 10 years that I got turned on. And uh, yeah, this was first. Uh, 
proclamation just blew me away. I was like, wow, this is this is a uh, definitely different. Um, George, very quickly, as a drummer, so what do you think about John Weathers drumming? It's very interesting. He's not a flash guy. You, you, you're never drawn to him with like some great fill or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you key in on him and listen to his beats, you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you're, he can you're groove, really, man. <laughs> yeah. He's one of those guys, which is... I, I think he tightened them up. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. I really yeah, do. Did. And like you said, he's still intricate in his own way. Sometimes he, but I think I think of John Weathers as driving down the center, and everyone else is out here doing stuff. He locks them in. I think that he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, from this one, I really like uh, the face. Uh, mm -hmm. I like the tunes where they break the violin out, and mm -hmm. that's probably my favorite from this one. Mm -hmm. And number two is Octopus. Um, yeah, like everybody said, this is kind of the the standard bearer for them. At great opener, Advent and Panurge. Mm -hmm. This actually even has a, a good softy, uh, the beautiful softy. Think of me with kindness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Think of me um, with kindness is uh, one of the best songs I ever did, in my opinion. Yep. I, 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 I carry Muneer singing it live mm -hmm. in Montreal is a memory I'm going to take to my grave. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I love the instrumental, Boys in the Band. That's just really, really good, fine instrumental. Um. My number one, though, Freehand. Nice. Uh, I don't know what it is. I think it's just the most complete statement that they have. Uh, th to me, there's no downtrack on this one, at even, anywhere even close. Um, just the same, and the title track being the, the two main highlights, but it's just a good, really, really good listen all the way through. Mm -hmm. The production's excellent. From the moment I heard this one, I was like, oh, yeah, this is the one. So that's my number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one George, of the things. Right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was going to say, George, did did you make the immediate connection when you heard Haken, to uh, Haken's Cockroach King? Yes, <laughs> and there's a, <laughs> a new album too that just screams Gentle Giant too. Yeah, I take it they're fans, right? Fauna <laughs> is clearly an homage to Gentle Giant in the best way possible, and it, it it's really well yeah. Really well. You know, we were talking about. Uh, vocals before and you mentioned Carrie uh, I think like especially early on on the first few albums when you had uh, Derek Carrie and Phil all singing I mean that gave them this really rich rich sound and, and, and you know even though you can arguably say that none of these guys are like quintessential classic rock vocalists mm -hmm. but they all do they all sing a little bit different I think it really kind of accentuates the kind of quirkiness of the music um, in, in a way that like other bands couldn't really pull off, you know? I mean, I, I don't think any of them, you know, we're not going to confuse any of them with a Phil Collins or a, you know, whoever, but Ian Anderson. Yeah. But, but I think that they, they all have very distinct vocal styles and, you know, maybe they lost a little bit of that when Phil left the band. But then I think, you know, obviously Derek kind of took over and became the de facto lead singer. And then you would have Carrie sing a song or two on the albums. But uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we all marvel at their instrumental abilities. But I think what they did with their voices is pretty much just as incredible, especially on, you know, some of these uh, songs where they just that's what they did. Right. They accentuated the vocals. So pretty cool. All right, Eric, let's move over to you. All right. Well, with, with General Giant for me, I kind of felt like it was the one of the first prog bands I discovered that people weren't pushing on me I must have read about them somewhere but I kind of felt like I went through that on my own you know I had people giving me Genesis giving me yes when I was learning I, and I just love these guys I fell in love with them um and vocally I know I bag on vocalists all the time when they <laughs> collectively sing it's unbelievable and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about that one in a second but I'm going with my number three is freehand um I think just the same and the title track itself are probably two of my favorite songs that they do absolutely killer so right there i knew freehand was going to be in here somewhere as we all talked about that was the hard part was i think i had five mm -hmm. and i'm like i don't know how i'm going to do three and then you kind of whittle <laughs> it down but just absolutely amazing i don't know why my cover is this cover but i'm going with three friends as my number two i love the concept and I'm not big on lyrics and I don't sit there and read, but I will say 
having just talked about the vocals, there it is. There's nothing that gives me shivers when they go from Mr. Class and Quality into Three Friends. That yep. vocal oh. carries church organ. I mean, I've listened to that 100, 200 times. I get a chill every time I hear yep. it. That is absolutely amazing to me. Um, and my number one is The Power and the Glory. Oh. To me, it's yep. it's a very concise statement. I think, I don't know what it is, but it rocks hard, cogs and cogs. It, when you listen to that, there's so many little things going on here and there. Um, it's just so intricate. And yet some of these songs are maybe their most catchy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think it's a, you know, because you guys were talking about what would you give somebody? I might give them that as, as check this out. If you like this, go from there. I just think it, to me, as much as I love it, I think it's one of their most accessible of the older ones, uh, but very difficult assignment. Uh, and it might change next week. So who knows? <laughs> All right. Very true. So, you know, there's so much. I, I'm going to have to. Go ahead, Luis. To sign off because the rehearsal is about to begin. I just want to introduce you to the band. This is Sergio. Sergio. Luz Arreada. As you can see, Pete, the CDs are fucking real. There you go. I don't know why you, you guys haven't had them, but. They're not um, real till Ken has them. That's right. true. Right? Here's Ernesto. Guitarist. Saludo. And um, this is the room where it all happens. There's what I'm saying. He's sucking himself up. And um, we're going to start playing. So I'm sorry I have to leave. I fucking love you guys. And we'll be there the next time. All the best. Have a good one. Rock out. Cheers. Hey guys. All right. Louis Nasser, everybody. All right, so we got picks from uh, Anthony and Chad. So before I do mine, let's go through there. So Anthony, number three, is acquiring the taste. Surprise. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. I'm squeeze that in, right? Yeah. I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number two is Freehand. And Anthony's number one is In a Glass House. Yep. All right, Thank Chad, you. his number three is in a glass house. Mm -hmm. His number two is Octopus. And his number one is The Power and the Glory. Mm -hmm. So The Power and the Glory and the, in the Glass House are they're in a dead heat for number one. All right. And now we'll do mine. And I don't think mine's going to change that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for me, my number one and my number two... Uh, I, that was pretty easy because they've been my one and two for a while now. Um, but I will say I've done this exercise so many times over the years and my top ones always change. Mm -hmm. For the last couple of years, it's been my one and two, but like my number three and number four and my number five had, had just consistently changed. And I really had a hard time with my number three. I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Even now, I'm kind of like, but I'm going to go with uh, Freehand as my number three. To me, this is the album that I always recommend to a newbie to to, the, to Gentle Giant. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, George kind of hit it on. It's got that kind of like those tracks that just kind of pull you in right from the outset. I mean, you know, like Ken mentioned, side one mm -hmm. just smokes. It's great, but it's so... You know, Eric mentioned too, just the same and freehand. It's just very accessible, even though there's a lot of good luck going on on there. Um, and I think it's got one of their best productions too. I, I really love it a lot. So I'm going to go with that as my number three. And uh, my number two is going to be Octopus. Like everybody said, I, you know, maybe some of their greatest songs are on here. It flows really, really nicely. It's crazy complex as hell and just weird but I love it for it. And, uh, you know, the advent of Panurge is probably one of their great openers, I would yep. say, but they have a lot of really good album openers, you know, it's just the same is pretty damn good too. So, yep. I don't know. so that's my number two. Well, my number one is the first one I ever bought. And I remember the first, I remember like it was yesterday. I, I, uh, it was the early nineties and I was, um, getting into like a lot of the 
prog rock greats from the 70s and going like deeper on some of the bands that I had never really listened to much before because I only really listened to hard rock and metal for most of my younger years. And then I remember reading some prog book and they were talking about Gentle Giant and how they were one of the hardest rocking of all the classic British prog bands. And I was like, remember, they opened up for Black Sabbath. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, all I need to do is read that. And I was like, oh, hardest rocking prog band. I'm like, all right, I like I like hard rocking stuff. So I went to Tower Records in Nanuet, New York, and I bought Octopus, Three Friends, the first album and acquiring the taste all in one shot. They were all like seven ninety nine a CD each. They were cheap as all hell. And then I like, I was going home and I was like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, why in the world does three friends and the first album have the exact same album cover? Yep. <laughs> I can never understand them. Right. So yeah, makes no sense. I mean, not that, not that this is a great album cover because it isn't at all, but, um, but yeah, but uh, this is the one that really spoke to me out of all those that I bought initially. Cause at first I was kind of like, wow, this is really weird. This mm -hmm. is really different. I'm not hundred percent sure I like this, but then this started to kind of really pull at me in prologue and school days and mm -hmm. working all day. And, you know, mm -hmm. peel the paint was oh, the yeah. one like, like, like Lewis mentioned that is so heavy. And that guitar solo just like mm -hmm. amazing. And that's what really, really, yeah. Maybe so, like on that one, Pete, we're talking about front loaded. I like the backside of Three Friends much better oh. than not much well, better, but I like those last three. This whole album is really good, and I think it's only what 32 Great. minutes. It's yeah, really it's short. short. Uh, and this is like really their only concept album. I think it's it's a cool concept, and I don't know. I just find there's a warmthness to this album, and, a, and it's so charming that's a little bit different than all their other ones. And it's always really resonated with me. So th this has either been my number one or my number two for many, many years. I think it's just a fantastic, fantastic album. Uh, so that's my pick for number one. But you know, uh, Eric, Eric um, pointed it out, and so um, that um, that sweet ending off um, Three Friends is just amazing, bone chilling. You know, yeah, I love yeah. listening to that. Mm -hmm. I could just put that on repeat all day. And so great, great album. Great, which is great. It's got this haunting quality, and you, know, you got the the trumpet in the background, right, and the violin and the the keys. It's just and the way they layer the vocals. I mean, that whole you know the, the title track, Mister Class and Quality, going to Three Friends, mm -hmm. so good. It's yep. amazing. Yep. They're, they're not a casual listen. There's, no. So much, no, there's so much going on in the mix. There's these guys. I mean, they all played so many different instruments, and you really have to listen to what's going on. And the more you intently listen you really start picking out things that maybe you didn't realize was there the first time you heard it and uh yeah it's there's some like really cool weird shit going on in the background that pops out at you the more you, you know, know, their, their music was so dense but yet you know you listen to playing the fool um playing the fool which was an album i used to listen to with my buddies and they they we were just in floor just floored by what we were listening to by uh, these guys live you know, right. the, that they could know, pull it off live. We yep. created all of it live. Yep. I, I got to see them live. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. It was, that was I had to rub it in. And uh <laughs> <laughs> did you go see him? Did you go see him out in Comac? I saw them. No, I saw them I saw them at the Palladium, 1977. Okay. There's a missing piece tour. Okay. Oh, Dr. Nice. Field, mm -hmm. Dr. Field did opening up for about five minutes before they got thrown off the stage. <laughs> they got they got pelted. Yeah, absolutely pelted. And, you know, Lee Brilliant from from the, from Doctor Feelgood. He had this thing where he would come out with a beer bottle and he would shake it up and put it between his legs, and it would just squirt out and shoot out all over the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were, as soon as he did that, they were throwing everything imaginable at the band, <laughs> and, and they left. And then when and then Gentle John came out, John Weathers. He, he came out like with the beer bottles. He, he, he was doing his take on, on them. It was, it was pretty funny. They, but they had so much going on live. I mean, these guys could play so many different instruments. It was just, yeah, it was it was crazy. It was great. So we got uh, three first place votes for Glass House, three for Power and the Glory. So I guess they kind of tie, but we have five second place votes for Octopus. Mm -hmm. So... You know the general consensus is though those seem to be the the ones that most kind of pick on. But let, let's talk a little bit about some of the ones that didn't really get 
uh, a lot of love tonight. So what do you guys feel about the first album? Oh, man. What's a, that's a very dense album. Uh, and I think it's their longest album at that. It's a very dense album. They're not and nothing bad about it. Yeah. But you know, what's it like? Um, you listen to it, and still, they didn't sound like anybody. They didn't yeah. sound like they didn't sound like King Crimson. They didn't sound like Jethro Tull. Um, what's it? Like? They didn't sound like the Moody Blues. You know, this is just a band that was on a totally different. Yeah, they record. definitely did their own thing for yeah, sure. They really did. They were tr truly original. It's when you, got a couple bluesy things in there. I too, was just going to say, the album's yeah. a little bluesy, yeah. A little yeah. Bit. When you listen to it collectively, you listen to all the albums, you, you and in retrospect, it's a band that's trying to, that's discovering itself. Yes, yes. So that's, it's a great record. Mm -hmm. And, it and is. you know, if they were, a, if that was a one and done band, you know, we'd all be paying $500 for that album. <laughs> you know? it, yeah, I mean, again, I, I, it goes back to what I said originally. You know, that was 1970. Yep, mm -hmm. it was nothing that sounded like that really in 1970. Oh, mm -hmm. I love you know, that. You go listen to the Simon Dupree stuff, which mm -hmm. they did right before that, and then you go listen to that album. You're like, these were the same guys, right? Totally different, Crazy. Right? Mm -hmm. Crazy. Plus, this this Mellotron on the first album. Got to yes. got mm -hmm. to mention that. Uh, I give Anthony a lot of props for putting Acquiring the Taste at number three. I really like that album a lot, but that's, so that's mm -hmm. a really challenging challenge. Great. Yeah, they're, most, they're most challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's like if, if you're going to pick <laughs> one album not to give to. <laughs> Acquiring the Taste is not one that you give to a newbie no. to this band. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. But if once you've gotten Gentle Giant, you realize how great acquiring the taste is because yeah. I think it's really, really good. Uh, weird cover, notwithstanding. Uh -huh. um, interview. Well, I mean, we did a whole episode on interview. I I really like interview a lot. I love design, it. Design, design. <clears throat> it, it's think, good, but I think that if you follow the arc of their catalog, I think it it, it falls off from yeah. from freehand. And you know, there's there's just a a veneer of commerciality to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's but in and of itself, it's a very fine album, but mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't hold up to Freehand and Power and the Glory or you know, working way backwards. They, it's kind of, I've always thought it's kind of like the younger sibling to Freehand and maybe a little Freehand light in spots. It's got a similar feel to it. Um, well, you know, we'll probably talk more about the missing piece when the uh, when the reissue comes out, but um, that's not a bad album. Oh, no, I think it's a good album. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, Memories uh, of Old Days is beautiful. Yeah. Memories of Old Days is amazing. It's a great days. song, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the rest of the album quite hits like that does. <laughs> but you know, again, <laughs> I think it shows <laughs> that they could write pop tunes. Mm -hmm. There's some decent songs on there that are catchy. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, nobody else thought so, but um, <laughs> I mean, they obviously were trying to stay afloat, and I think trying to maybe get more airplay or commercial, but you know, some of those songs could have been done by other people and, and they might have gone and done something. I thought well, it just shows, I think, how varied they could be as writers. No, I liked For Nobody. Yeah, for Nobody was good. good. The Stinker was, uh, I bet you thought we couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I kind of tried to ignore that one. <laughs> kind of like their answer yeah, for the whole nobody. punk movement, you know? It's like, <laughs> I think uh, some of the songwriting is pretty good on that album. I don't really like the production of that album all that much. Uh, maybe they were just kind of moving into different techniques based on the time and whatnot. I think if you have a little warmer production similar to some of the earlier albums, some of those uh, songs might have sounded a little different. Um, I don't know. Then, of course, there's uh, Giant for a Day. Which... There's only one song I like. Spooky on Boogie. That's a good one. That's all right. <laughs> I dig it. It's got vibes, Chuck. I like the vibes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a misfire for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I hate to say that in this catalog that I love so much that there's one album that I really don't care for at all. But that I just I don't really have. It's one I never listen to anymore, and I I can't really say a lot of good things about it. it it's a it's a difficult listen. You know, you hear after listening to all the great albums that came before it, um, even a missing piece because I have that on vinyl. I remember listening to uh, buying um a giant for a day and listening to it, and I was like. Can't listen to this again. It was just sad. <laughs> yep. 
But civilian, what did I know you're going to go on to civilian? I always thought that civilian was a big step up. It probably might have been, in my opinion, just me personally. So I thought that it was the best time that they did since um, since some um, interview. That's I would just, agree. Yeah, just I would agree. yeah I, I enjoy that more than I enjoy the missing piece, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think interview, I mean, uh, civilian for me was a logical step into the 80s for them. Mm -hmm. because you had, you know, yes was doing something. a lot of gary green too mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah it's it's a it's a fairly hard rocking album and it sounds more modern it's you know it's missing what ken mentioned earlier that whole medieval type yeah. of a flair it's really not that at all but you know rush were going in a different direction i mentioned genesis yes all the prog bands were doing something a little bit different a little more modern utilizing new studio techniques and technologies and i thought it's it's a pretty good album, and I would have liked to see them continue in that direction. But if you you know talk to the guys in the band or read interviews, they basically said, "Yeah, that wasn't us." So we knew it was time to pack. It, it. To me, that record was neither fish nor foul. It 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 wasn't commercial enough. Mm -mm. It wasn't prog enough. Nope. Right. It just was just existed, and I I, I never I personally never latched onto it. So what's interesting is that after that album. All those guys, they just, they like left, almost in a sense, left the industry as musicians, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And all fabulous music. Well, um, except for John Weathers, he went on to do Man. Right. He played with Man. Man. Played with Man. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and Gary Green, you know, all I know is he popped up on Eddie Jobson's album. But the Showmans, <laughs> the, the Showmans they, they left. I mean, Derek, yeah. Derek became, a, you know, a record executive. Yep. Ray became a producer. Yeah, uh, Ray was a producer, uh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Gary, uh, in fact, I it's probably, you know, you're probably a little young, uh, George, but Gary, I know, was moved to Chicago, and they, they think he still lives in the suburbs of Chicago, but he was playing in, like, local blues bands and cover bands for many years during the 80s and the 90s, pretty silently, right? Probably nobody had any clue who he was. Oh, sure. So he was playing, but he was, was he recording anything? Not to my knowledge. No, well, and they've resisted so. any temptation to come back. That's impressive. Yep. Everybody comes back. I remember they were Everybody offered a lot of money. Back. They were offered a lot of money to come back. You know, Everybody comes back. You know, I'll, I'll never forget yeah. the interview is still up on the Sea Tranquility webzine, but many, many years ago, I went to uh, Derek's office in New York studio in New York City when he had the DRT label. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions I asked him, I'm like, all right, and this was probably like in the early 2000s. And I said, um, it's now been 20 plus years. Most of your contemporaries left, came back, left, came back. You guys haven't. All I read about and hear about is how all the, you know, longstanding prog fans want to see Gentle Giant reunite. Would you guys ever consider it? And he basically said, it might be fun for a show, but I know you guys, meaning all of us, I know you guys that one would never be enough. He goes, we'd rather not do it at all. Because one show yeah. would be enough. It's it, strange. That's strange. You would, you would think there would have been, at some point, they would have said, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just do it. Let's just do it, right? We'll do mm -hmm. Near Fest or the cruise or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it and is. The Near Fest thing would have been, would have been perfect for it, right? That, I mean, that would have been perfect. And now it's, now it's kind of too late because, you know. I'm well, sure Chad and Rob bugged the shit out of them, you know. Probably. For a period. And what's, what's amazing, too, is that here we've been talking for this entire program about the musicality and the genius of their songwriting and all that. Mm -hmm. So arguably, you could say they were one of the most talented of all of these classic prog bands from the 70s. Mm -hmm. And yet, really... When the band broke up, it's not they. They didn't really. They used their talents to do other things. They didn't stay in music and continue to expand on what they were doing. They they went into producing and managing and all this other stuff, which is just bizarre when you think about it, right? But <clears throat> yeah, well, Derek Derek did okay for himself. He did very well for himself. Yeah, That's I'm sure he doesn't regret it at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if they ever did like get together, like, and nobody knows it, you know, like at a wedding or somebody's wedding, you know, or they get <laughs> wedding, like, 
they went up there and they sing cogs and cogs or something. You know? <laughs> Could you imagine the horrified people at a wedding who don't know who they are and they're like, what the hell is this? The hell is this? <laughs> yeah, this is terrible. <laughs> I hate the vocals. <laughs> oh, no good. Well, we'd be in the audience like, yes, through the Macarena. <laughs> You know, the wedding the wedding band walks over to Derek and hands him a microphone, you know. And they, you know, they break into proclamation. Uh, how cool would that have been? So, uh, you know, again, so everybody watching, oh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, we got a tie for first place and we got a, you know, octopus charted really high here too. But it wasn't really all about where these albums ranked. I think it was just a good excuse to go listen to the catalog again and really think about which ones we prefer and but really how many great albums are in this catalog really are yeah. I mean, we, we really only had kind of bad things to say about one of them out of all of them and they're all worthy of being discussed here so uh that's where you all come in watching at home down in the comments try and list your three favorite gentle giant albums if you can if you can uh my honorable mention would have been this this in a glass house probably would have been the next in line but i can make a case for power and the glory or acquiring the taste or interview any any day of the week and, and even the debut so they're all really good they're all really good cool all right so there you have it everybody another episode of in the prog seat in the books this is on the web at www.catranquility.org we're on facebook we're on youtube all together all, all the damn time. time we are returning to album war next uh, episode uh, and then we'll probably take a break from that for a little bit. We got a fun one. We're going to kind of revisit that whole topic of these albums after like a major lineup change. And the albums in question, we're going to tell you now so you guys have time to listen to them and think about us over the next couple of weeks. Drama by Yes. Lark's Tongues and Aspic by King Crimson. Danger Money by UK. And Rain Dances by Camel. Those are the four. So get to work over the next couple of weeks and uh, we will be back. We will be back. So for George Lemay, Louis Nasser, Chuck Alvarez, Ken Golden, Eric Porter, Chad Hutchinson, Anthony Ferraro, Chris Canzanari, I'm Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching in the proxy. See you in two weeks. There's Anthony. He, he's always with <laughs> us. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. <laughs>